I sent the book to Andrew, uh, the story of Owen, as sort of a shot in the dark almost in publishing terms for an open call. And um, I ne sort of never really expected to hear back for several months. Um, and instead I got an email the next day uh, that said he had started reading the book, um, which was unusual, but also sort of a, a good omen, I think, in terms of, of getting on a start of things. I knew who Andrew was when I sent him the book. A few of my friends had been published with him or were being published with him. And I did some like light Twitter stalking, um, which is the custom, really. And so I knew that he had always written or that he always published sort of different books. And like for the first couple of months, really, I was like, am I weird enough for Andrew Carr? Um, but then I realized that I was and that everything was going to be OK. <laughs> It has been my good fortune to um, publish a, a lot of really amazing debuts, and it, there's a moment when you read somebody and it's like, this is, this is a, you, you lean into it, it's like, this is original, I am surprised, I'm a little uncomfortable, I don't know what's going on here, but there's a, also a sense of confidence in the writing, um, and like, you're just in the presence of a personality and a storyteller, and you know, all of those authors they're pretty distinct in what you know what kinds of stories they tell and how they tell them. But for me, the the that first encounter with their work, um, it was a very similar feeling that I got. Like this is this is something very new um, and distinct. And that's I, I think that that's not unique to me. That's what every editor wants. Um, and I've just been very lucky to find some amazing ones. With the story of Owen, I was really concerned that I was going to get um, the in er initial offer and it was going to be something like, this is a really great idea, could you move them to Indianapolis? Um, and Andrew instead requested more hockey jokes and an explanation for how bagged milk worked. <laughs> um, and in that moment, I knew that it was going to be a good sort of good from both sides going forward that we both kind of knew what was what was on the table um, even if several of the characters who were actual historical people in the story of Owen at that time Andrew thought I had invented. <laughs> yeah um, there were some important figures in Canadian history that for the better part of a year I just assumed Kate had created from whole cloth. Um, I know better now it's fine. <laughs> and with the story of Owen I probably took him a little more literally <laughs> um, in terms of editorial, whereas now he might make a suggestion and I will say something like, well, okay, I'll do something, but it's going to be the exact opposite of that. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> Which is good. Uh, yeah, I, the, the, the relationship um, grows over time and we, you know, we have so much more experience just having conversations with each other and uh, it's for me as an editor that it, it makes me so much more comfortable making suggestions when I know that Kate will go wherever she wants to go so that I can have the freedom to make a suggestion that might catalyze something surprising and wonderful and not worry that she's going to take a suggestion that that doesn't feel right to the book to her. Um, that just doesn't happen. I think in terms of diversity, the publishing world is slowly starting to like meander in a better direction. Um, authors are starting to get more recognition. Um, marginalized authors are starting to get more recognition. And um, the actual people who work in publishing are starting to hire outside of like very select pools. <laughs> Um, and I think that that's, it's happening slowly, but we're aware of it and it's starting to happen at least. I don't know really that much about the real world sometimes it feels like. Um, and being Canadian, my answer is a little bit different. Um, but uh, in Canada right now, we're very much focused on reconciliation and, or at least trying to focus on reconciliation and figuring out how that's going to work um, or how it's not going to work. And so it's kind of a different problem set than um, you might be working on in the U.S. So it's, it's, a weird, it's always a weird question for me to answer because I'm like, well, at home we're doing this. Um, but I'm not sure how, how it works down here. And 
I, my entire career, um, you know, the 15 plus years I've been working in trade publishing in one form or another, this has been part of the conversation. And then you, you read back and you read like Walter Dean Myers in the New York Times in the 80s. This in some ways is cyclical. Um, hopefully we are on a rising cycle that when we, we're, that this moment that we're focusing on the historical and structural inequalities in our industry and the way books are from creation to sale, the problems there, like hopefully we're doing a better job at it this time around and hopefully we will stay in this moment for a very long time and make some tangible changes. Um, it's, it's, not for, it's not for the white guy to, <laughs> to express optimism or hope. That's not my role in this. Um, I try to do the best work I can um, with my authors and I try to listen very carefully, not just to praise but to criticism and I try to make new mistakes and apologize gracefully for the old mistakes I've made. World building for me is always the most fun part um, and with most of my big world building books, so um, Owen and That Inevitable Victorian Thing are my two books with the most world building in them. And most of it is just taking real places that I know and love and have distinct memories of and um, twisting them slightly to incorporate them into um, the book. And that kind of sort of merging is, is super fun for me. A lot of the times that's where the book will start. I'll have an idea of like, the story of Owen very specifically began with a dragon attacking the Burlington Skyway um, in the harbor in Hamilton. And then the book sort of grew up around it. Um, and I love sort of taking the places I know and making them book worthy, I guess. Um, in terms of the fairy tale ones, they were more um, academic. Uh, literally, that's what I went to school for. Um, so it was kind of fun to also work from that angle. But I love taking what is real and what is imaginary and putting them together for world building. And that's been both the challenge and the, um, the excitement of putting things together. I usually describe Exit as my most fantasy book ever um, because something terrible happens to a teenage girl and when she tells people about it they believe her. Um, but the world building for that one is actually the closest to the camp that I went to, the town that I grew up in, and the teachers at my high school. Um, so it's, it's probably the, the realest for me book I've ever written, but also the most far out and fantastical premise. Um, for a variety of terrible reasons. I really enjoy retelling stories. Um, a lot of times they're very, very old stories that have been told for countless, countless years and lately have been edited either by people like Walt Disney or by the Brothers Grimm or like various other white guys. And now I feel almost like it's, it's our turn. So I think that's why there are so many great YA retellings. Um, and I was really excited to sort of throw myself in to see how that went. Um, but I love sort of taking, taking those stories and making them about the characters who were in the background or the characters who died or the characters who were just treated so poorly in the original narrative and kind of drawing them out and giving them more, more to do. It's kind of post fairy tale. It's one of those stories that falls into like folk tale, fairy tale, mythos. Um, but I've always really liked the King Arthur stories, um, specifically the background King Arthur stories that aren't necessarily about Arthur himself. Um, and there was very recently a really amazingly terrible movie about um, King Arthur that has sort of relit all of the King Arthur thoughts I'd had, so I imagine at some points those will show up, but I'm not sure how or when or in what universe yet. Possibly space. <laughs> I don't remember, like, life without Star Wars. Um, when I was very little, we had the vinyl um, version of Return of the Jedi, and 
so two of my very early memories are Carrie Fisher's voice and Darth Vader's breathing mechanism. Um, and I just remember, uh, like I, I have very few memories before that. And so I've been a Star Wars fan basically my whole life and we just keep getting new stuff. And um, there have always been books, but there haven't really been true YA books until Claudia Gray's Lost Stars came out. And I decided that I would give it a shot. And my agent was like, we can try. So it worked out pretty well. So when I finished writing uh, that inevitable Victorian thing, it was about 60,000 words long. And I thought it was going to be twice that long when I sat down to write it. So I got to the end of it and I was feeling terrible about everything. Um, and I, I was at the cottage and I drove up to the top of the hill to get internet signal and emailed it to Andrew. And literally as soon as I hit send, I was like, whew, it's Andrew's problem now. <laughs> um, because I knew that he would look at it and find all of the places. I, when I write my first drafts, I leave tremendous gaps because my brain knows what's going on. I just forget to write that part down. So I knew that Andrew would have a list of things that would make the book much longer, um, and he did. And of all of the books we've done together, uh, Victorians has probably changed the most um, in terms of things we added to the plot and to the structure of the book after I finished the first draft. This couldn't have been our first book. Um, we needed to learn each other um, pretty well to be able to to do this book because uh, I by this by this point I understood that if I had a question about something in the world, if I had a question about a character, Kate would know the answer. Like the whole story is there. Sometimes it's just not on the page. She's like an iceberg. Then you know we just need to bring some of it up above the waterline. Um, so I, I knew how to approach that. Uh, the, I think the other layer of difficulty for this was like, understanding, this is, this is a complicated book uh, in a lot of ways, and understanding all of, the, uh, all of those complexities in the same way and, and establishing a shared vision for that complexity. Um, that took a lot of conversations. Um, it took, like, I, I watched I watched a miniseries. I watched. Uh, I, I watched lots of different movies. There, there's, and this is pretty typical. Like you're, you're, one of the things that an editor has to do is try to occupy the sort of same creative headspace as as the author. And that was that was as important in this book um, as in any book I've ever published. Uh, there was there was a lot of very specific things that I had to get my head around. Um, and I, I, I feel I fear I'm making that sound like it was onerous somehow, it was a delight. Part of it involved watching Pacific Rim, so I don't think it was onerous at all. Yes, that was one of the movies. <laughs> when it came to writing uh, that inevitable Victorian thing, I wanted to write um, a book that wasn't a perfect world. It's not a utopia, it's not a dystopia either. It's very similar to our world in a lot of ways, just in the future and they started correcting their mistakes much, much earlier than we did. And so in that way, I suppose it's a little bit, I don't really like the word aspirational, but it's a little bit aspirational and like if you would just talk to each other maybe kind of things. Um, and I think that might be its value as a teaching tool um, to sort of acknowledge that the world could be better and if you inherit problems from your parents, you don't have to perpetuate them. You can sort of, by whatever means necessary, um, come up with compromises to forge your own path so that your descendants don't have to do the same thing. Editing for me is about asking the right questions. Um, at the you know, at, I don't, I don't write a gigantic editorial letter to any of my authors. I write. Um, hundreds, sometimes thousands of notes in the margins of the manuscript, many of which are questions, many of which are questions that begin, what if you tried this? Um, how does this sound? Uh, and then we have lots and lots of phone conversations, or you know, if, if I'm lucky enough to have a local author or an author who's willing to travel here frequently, we or you know drive for many hours um, together, we have conversations about things that may seem not to be about the book, but are actually deeply about the book. So the the actual changes in the book, for me at least, they don't, I don't. It never seems to me like I'm suggesting something so radical as cutting a character. Sometimes characters get cut, but I can't 
honestly think of a single example in all the books I've done where I, I said, this character needs to be cut. I have gone into books thinking that this character or these two characters might be one character, but the way to get there is through, I'll, this seems inefficient, but it's actually not, is through a larger conversation about the role of the character in the book. Um, I'm just not wired to be that autocratic, I guess. Well, the first thing I do when I get an edit letter um, is I read all the notes all the way through without making any replies at all. Um, and then I usually don't think about it for a couple of days um, while I'm kind of stewing it over. Um, we've never made a huge structural change, I don't think. We've moved some chapters around. Um, and there's a character in that inevitable Victorian thing who is coincidentally named Andrew, um, who became a much um, bigger character in the subsequent drafts than he was originally, mostly because Andrew kept insisting that we described what his coats looked like. And um, so we've never had that sort of like massive change in a book, um, but usually I go through and I answer all of the like quick questions first, usually to say, no, Andrew, this is staying in. Um, but then go through again and sort of really get to why this has to stay in and if I need to rewrite the scene to keep it, which often happens. Um, but generally speaking, I give myself a little bit of space and arrange a phone call. If I just sometimes, um, even though I've read it and I've understood it, it's handier to talk about it out loud about why we need to do something. Um, but it's, it's generally a pretty straightforward process. Well, I mean, it, in some ways, it's it's easy because I'm not a, I'm not her co-author in that regard. I no, my, and I say this about all of my editorial relationships. My my job is not to um, it, my job is to provide interesting friction. Um, I, my job is to challenge things, but not to win. Like I don't I don't go into a conversation about a change in a book looking to win that conversation. I look forward. I look into these moments looking to create a scenario where interesting ideas can happen. Sometimes something goes into a book so easily unchallenged, it just it just comes from the imagination, but it's not done yet. It needs it needs to be it needs to bang up against some resistance before it's really done. And I I'm there to provide the resistance. But in the end if 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 Kate says or if any author says this is a non-negotiable thing, then, then that's when the negotiation is over. But the, the point is to have a relationship where you can have the conversation to its productive conclusion and not set it up in such a way that you have to, like, somebody has to be putting their foot down. Like, that's an editorial failing as far as I'm concerned. I think the closest I've ever come to putting my foot down was actually the ending of that inevitable Victorian thing, uh, which we worked on for about a year. And um, the problem, though, was not with the ending. It was how we were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it took basically almost a solid year of phone calls and emails and watching North and South and then reading North and South before we actually came up with why the ending was the way it was and why it needed to stay that way. Um, and then once we had kind of, once we'd had that phone call where I had figured, literally had figured out how to say the words about why the ending was like that, um, Andrew had immediately come back with like, okay, here's what we can do with the scene. And I had said, okay, we can work with this. Um, but I think that's the, the longest we've ever gone. Yeah, definitely. A sort of on a gap of not understanding what the other one was trying to do. And it's a complicated ending. I mean, in, you know, and this is, I find this is frequently the case with the young adult fiction. Like the ending of the book, it's not really the ending of much, really. Like they, they, you know, Typically, there's there's like it, it's the beginning of something in some cases. Of some books, literally the beginning of something, uh, and that makes that that me. I'm always thinking about endings of YA novels. I'm very it's. I often shelve that for the in the editorial conversation. Like, I'm just gonna let the ending sit over there in the corner, and we're gonna work on other things. And the ending is going to eventually make itself available for us to get by working on other things. I think one of the things I love most about YA right now, as both a reader and a writer, is how boundary pushing it can be. Um, also, I think it's sort of inherent of being a teenager. I wasn't super boundary pushing as a teenager, um, sort of. I mean, I was a little bit more sneaky about it. But um, 
I think it's, it's a very natural time to be testing the limits of things, and I love books that encourage that. Uh, it's a very similar answer for me. I, I think uh, the adolescence as a social construct absolutely fascinates me. Uh, it is a boundary testing time. Um, I truly believe that YA is a literature of adolescence, not just for adolescents. Um, and they'll, all of the all of the books that I've, you know, that I've loved um, have had something to say about um, what it means to be a teenager, um, what it means to be on the precipice of adulthood, and that is a like the most boundary testing time in our lives. So, and on top of that, the just the way the category in the business has shook out, it is not nearly as ghettoized or you know, segregated as. Um, as uh, adult fiction tends to be, that has something to do to the credit of the, the with the is, is to the credit of teen readers because their tastes haven't they haven't identified as a certain kind of reader, so they read more broadly, they read more um, with op with more open minds, uh, and I I think if they're going to put that kind of effort into testing, then you owe it to them to give them things to test with. My alternate history is um, pretty straightforward. I went to school for archaeology, um, and that's also what my master's is in, so I think in an alternate world, um, I would be probably a very poor and frustrated academic um, who really enjoyed archaeology and didn't enjoy the bureaucracy of it quite so much. Um, but I did Near Eastern archaeology and then forensic archaeology and crime scene investigation, so that's basically where my, my, first, my first love, I suppose, was. <laughs> I've never worked a day in my life in anything but book publishing, um, so I don't really have any other useful skills. You could be a I, professional bike rider. I could be. I could be a professional bike rider, perhaps a uh, very slow one. Uh, I have a. I have a degree in French horn performance, so I suppose there there could have been a moment in college where I decided I wanted to spend more time in practice rooms. Um, my first job in publishing, where I really fell in love with making books. Um, I was working in the what they called at the time in the 90s the home arts department of the uh, of the publishing company. So it was decorating, cooking, entertaining. I spent and this is all pre digital days. Um, so I spent a great deal of that first internship with that company sorting. Like I would have five photos of a drape or something like that, and my job was to pick the uh, the A and the B and throw out the other three. Uh, and I did that for hours and hours and hours, and I kind of loved it. Um, so I guess there's there's an alternate. History where I'm, or an alternate future where I'm an interior designer. <laughs> I could see it. <laughs> I guess the biggest misconception with authors, um, for me anyway, is there's like no difference between the public perception of like someone who is not an author and someone who is J.K. Rowling. So there's like, there's literally no middle ground, even though 99.999% of publishing is that middle ground. Um, and I guess I do a lot of editor answers where they assume Andrew like corrects commas and stuff. I'm like, no, 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 it's much larger than that. <laughs> and he's really bad at Canadian commas. And he's really, no, there, there's no difference. Oh wait, there is. Yeah, there is. <laughs> Did, is this how it went? The first edition of the story of Owen has American Orthodox spelling. Yeah. And then the, the first printing, and then um, and then we 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 removed we added back in all of the U's essentially. Yeah, I think I think it's it was the, some reprint. It was like the third or fourth because it was after Prairie Fire. Yeah. And we decided in Prairie Fire that. Um, that we were going to leave all the Canadian spellings. And I was like, cool, what are we doing with the story of Owen? And Andrew was like, you can have them back. So we put them back in. So we put them back in. And then both Exit and Victorians have Canadian yeah, spellings. Yeah, she has, she has a, uh, a full Canadian usage agreement for forever now. And then, unless she's going to set a book go with absolutely no Canada in it, and then I guess we'll revisit. But I don't <laughs> foresee that. I think the, the, the misconception I encounter most about editors is that there is... Um, that there's a great deal of objectivity and authority in our work, um, that that I possess some sort of like measure of what a good thing is. Like that, because like, no, I have a measure of what I like. Um, this is an exceedingly subjective job. Um, a thing that happens frequently, and it will happen at Thanksgiving. I'm sure if I'm around family, somebody will ask. Um, 
have you ever rejected a New York Times bestseller? You know, the idea is that that question is like, would you feel like a fool? Like, and I will say, yes, actually very early on in my career I did it, and quite emphatically, and, I, you know, and I've done it since, and I will do it again. It's a very subjective thing. The reason it was a New York Times bestseller is because I didn't edit it. Um, that's, uh, and that, that is, I, I love that about this job, that, that you frequently encounter you know, when you talk to colleagues. Um, Oh, I saw that manuscript and it was out on submission. It was terrible. Oh God, I got into an auction and I'm going to die because I lost. You know, it's it is that's beautiful. That's you know, the combination of authors and other publishing professionals, not just editors, but book designers and publicists, and the various experiences and taste that they bring to the process of bringing a book into the world. That is that's all part and parcel with lots and lots of unique and interesting books. I think an effective editor is uh, an avid and curious reader. Um, some, a, a, a fundamental optimism. There's a, I, I say this often that the difference between reading as a critic and reading as an editor is you're looking for opportunity when you're reading as an editor. Um, whereas for a critic, you're looking, does this as it is now as a fully formed thing work? So when I'm reading a manuscript, I'm imagining, I, I try to find the places in the manuscript where where the hairs on the back of my neck stand up like that and then that becomes that becomes the minimum standard for the rest of the book um, I, I then ask like, okay you have to be this good on every page and the neat thing about authors is that as soon as you set them that challenge they then exceed it and the bar raises and then the challenge becomes when do you when do you tell them to stop when do you start when do you start whispering sweet nothings about the next book so we can actually push print on this one that is another important editorial qualifications gently pushing them on to the next one. Not one that's necessary with Kate, <laughs> but other authors sometimes. I think the definition of a successful author is kind of a strange one um, because it's really a very strange metric. Um, and for me, it's definitely someone who writes and still enjoys it and also still enjoys reading. Um, I think and taking sort of all other businessy aspects out of it because at some point to stay sane as an author you have to um, so basically someone who can just get up every morning and keep working and still enjoy at least part of it um, is for me what a successful author is honestly i'm not sure i would differentiate what high school kate decided on i decided i wanted to be an archaeologist in about grade 10 or so um, and then I went to school for archaeology, um, and then I went to England for archaeology, which is super expensive. And I don't really regret any of those things. Um, so I think that even in high school, I had pretty good input or imagination for whatever. Um, I might have suggested um, eating lunch in the cafeteria less frequently because uh, there was, it was very noisy in there and it, it was more entertaining to sort of hang out in other places in the school. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm mostly happy with the choices uh, that um, now that, uh, <laughs> that, that high school Andrew made. I guess I would probably tell him the, the ones that you're making that are making you really, really nervous, it's okay. Um, there's nothing you can do about how, how anxious you feel now. But later, when you reflect on them, um, they will be useful to you. Uh, and that's, you know, that's uh, uh, like the, the anxiety, like we have to make right career decisions or things like that. And like things like that there are somehow defined paths. That hasn't been my experience um, in, in retrospect. So I'd, I'd, if, if, it wasn't, if I wasn't worried about altering the future, I would probably just tell them to relax. But maybe being <laughs> incredibly anxious was important to that outcome. So I'd probably just shut up. Well, I graduated from university uh, with my master's in 2008 straight into an economic recession, which was a terrible time to be an arts major. And um, I couldn't get into any like uh, PhD programs that I wanted because they didn't have any funding anymore. Um, so I was working retail and talking with my financial planner and she was like, why don't you write something? And I was like, I don't think you understand how publishing works. <laughs> um, but she said it was okay, which went then when my mom was like, I don't really think this is a good idea. I could be like, my financial planner said it was okay. <laughs> um, and so I started um, committing to writing manuscripts and 
also, it was in the middle of a job interview with some random retail that I don't remember. And one of the, um, one of the questions was, um, where, like, that was a terrible, like, where do you see yourself in five years question? And, um, for no particular reason, because at that point I was just making up answers for job interviews, I said, well, I would like to publish a book before I'm 30. Um, and then I did. <laughs> It's funny. I mean, there are, there are definitely manuscripts that I have lost you know, through the acquisition process, you know, auctions or whatever, that I wish I could have edited, and I, those aren't worth discussing. That's unseemly. But there are like, there are books, and there are and, and books are done as far as I'm concerned. So I can't. I don't really want to edit them. But they're definitely authors. I would have like just just to have that contact with. Um, with the mind, like, I, I, I've recently started like properly reading James Baldwin. I did not read in college, to my great shame, but I'm, I'm remediating. And like, you know, the combination of reading him and then seeing interviews with him, like somebody got to talk to this guy anytime he wanted, and that's just that's amazing. So it's so when you you, you see you see people who is like. You want to know the intelligence behind this. You want to be able to buy them lunch. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's what I wish for. I read all the time when I was little, um, to the point where my fourth grade teacher would make me hand over books before I went out for recess. Um, like I read in the car, I read at home, I went to the library to read books that my mom had told me I couldn't read. Also, the library was air conditioned. Um, but the school library was, in a lot of ways, um, like a refuge. I wasn't super popular in elementary school, and it was cold outside. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in the library uh, reading the books there and playing Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego, um, which helped with history and geography and all that kind of shit. And puns. There's a lot of puns in that game. <laughs> um, and um, so that's basically where I spent a lot of time was the library. Yeah, I spent, uh, I, I, I mean, I've, I come from a family of readers. I have always identified as a reader. Um, I, I remember distinctly certain experiences uh, of, of reading um, books from the school library. I remember reading um, I read it too young, but the effect was strong. Um, Robert Cormier's book, I Am the Cheese, uh, at the behest of a school librarian, I think in fifth grade or something like that, and that book has a doozy of an ending. Um, like this, I think it was the first time I'd encountered a truly unreliable narrator, and it's like, it, it, you know, when, when you read that for the first time and nobody's ever really ripped the rug out from under you, like it, it's, it's, a, it's a moment you never forget. So I, like, I remember those librarians and those library checkouts that left a mark, um, that book, or um, the Tripod series um, by uh, John Christopher made a huge impression on me as a kid. And you know, I, I wish I remembered every librarian who did that, but I know that they were, I, I know there was a pair of hands that put a book in mine and it was, uh, it made all the difference. I love getting this question, where do you get your ideas from kids, because I give them the deadest eyes I can possibly muster up and go, how do you make them stop? <laughs> um, because it's true for one degree or another, I get ideas all the time. And sometimes it's really kind of like a fight to push them away. Um, with the fairy tales specifically, it's usually because something in the original tale made me angry. Um, so with A Thousand Nights, it was the sort of idea of a happily ever after um, after the king had like murdered so many people. Um, and with Spindle, it was the idea that they didn't tell this poor kid if she ever touched a spinning wheel, she'd die. Um, I wanted to sort of take that apart and see what happens if you tell her and if she knows and if everyone knows what the consequences are. So often there is um, a little bit of irritation or anger involved in my original inspiration, um, but it's the kind of useful thing that you can channel into a, into a direction. When I'm writing, I don't really have a specific group in mind, although sometimes towards the middle of a book, it will boil into, I really hope fill in the blank person likes this book. Um, with the story of Owen, it was mostly me that I really wanted to like the book at the end. 
Um, with Exit Pursued by a Bear, it was mostly Andrew that I really wanted to like the book. Um, that's why it's dedicated and why the, uh, there's a line at the, in the acknowledgement that says, is it teen enough for you now? <laughs> um, but mostly with the, when I'm writing, I, I'll get about halfway through and just be like, if this one person likes it, I will have done okay. And then usually they do. My advice for aspiring writers is three things. One, read everything you possibly can. And even if it's something that you don't love, if you can see the parts of it that make it work, um, that's good too. Two is always finish your stuff. You can't fix it if it's not there. So even if it's really, really rough, it's better to have a draft than to have nothing. And the third piece of writing advice is to ignore all writing advice outside of that. Um, and try to come up with a system that works for you. When people ask me as an editor what my writing advice is, it's please yourself. Um, because when writers are at talking to publishing people about like, what's your advice, the, the implicit thing is how can I please you? Well, you can please me by pleasing yourself. You should be writing like, from a place of great joy. Like, you should enjoy the process of creating so much that you are actively seeking more time in the day to create. Um, so I, I tell young authors, be very happy with what you're doing um, and do a lot of it and don't worry about the publishing part um, any more than you know, a little bit at most. Uh, set that aside and just write so that you're so happy with what you're doing that when anybody tells you to stop doing it, do you, you laugh at them. Um, it, that you so just write until you can't imagine doing anything else. I go through phases, like if I'm revising a book, it's really difficult for me sometimes to read for fun, um, which is useful because I read the books that I'm reading for work. Um, when I'm revising because I am thinking constructively and I'm thinking about what parts I like if I'm going to blurb the book or or what um, if I'm reading for if I'm reading to see how someone else told the story in fiction I can sort of pick it apart that way um, when I'm drafting I basically just like open brain insert book so it works a little bit more wholesale um, but my reading has probably shifted a little bit um, since I became a full-time writer but it's not any less fun I try to have categories of reading that are um, very distant from the work I do uh, that are for pleasure, but almost inevitably the, the a crack forms and it finds a shortcut back. But even even after even if even after the link is made, it it, rem it remains pleasurable. I think like for me, if it's not on a computer screen and it's you know, bound in between cardboard and it's done, and there's there's no aura of a deadline around it, it's pretty it's pretty pleasurable. I just watched Jason Reynolds answer a question very similar to this, and it's totally shifted my entire worldview on kids reading. Um, because I was lucky, I saw myself in books. Not always, but I could get close to it. And I think one of the things I'm most excited about with publishing right now is the increased attention on books by authors who will show kids themselves on the pages. And from my point of view, it's more a question of developing empathy. Um, but from their point of view, they've probably got empathy okay because they've been writing, reading books about white kids for a while. Um, but they're going to see themselves. And I think that is incredibly important. Reading for a kid is, I have small children myself, and they, watching the, the, the transformation in perspective, the, the broadening of... Like of, of how they see the world, just based on you know, a couple of years of reading, it, it, I think it's. I, I think the existence of reading in a life is a fundamental fork in the road. You are, if you are a reader, you're going to be a different kind of person. Uh, and I, I think the kind of the kinds of people who read and who read widely and who read with you know, curiosity and generosity are. You know, the people who will ultimately make the difference in the world. Mm -hmm.